Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Mark Clement. Clem, as he's known to many, is a football reporter on BBC One's Football Focus and Final Score. He's also one of the longest established voices on BBC Radio 5 Live, one of the original presentation team on BT Sport, and a former Times columnist. Mark's a keen walker and has conquered Hadrian's Wall and the Thames Path, as well as summiting Mount Kilimanjaro with his good friend Chris Kamara in aid of Marie Curie. Mark lives in London with his partner and has one grown-up daughter. Mark Clement, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you very much. It's one of those funny ones, isn't it, Jason? I, I was going to say I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Am I looking forward to talking about death? Well, I suppose in a funny way, I kind of am, having been through it a couple of times. So, you know, one of the aims of this podcast is to encourage conversations about death and dying. And can I start, Mark, by asking if you can tell me about a significant bereavement you've experienced in your life? Well, I think this is what I was alluding to when you welcomed me, Jason, which is that I've probably got to tell you about two, and that's the death of both parents. And I've been, I think, very, very fortunate in life. I've not experienced any sort of tragic deaths, except now that was coming on this, it kind of made me think about mum, because basically I lost my mum 34 years ago at the pitifully young age of just 58. But then dad, on the other hand, outlived her by 31 years, didn't pass away until 2019 at the age of 88. And so I had one parent taken away from me at such a young age and the other one squeezed every last vestige out of body and mind. And it was definitely time to go. And probably because mum said on her deathbed, look after your dad and get on with your life. I probably took it quite, quite, quite literally. And maybe over the years, it's made me certainly resilient. But sometimes I think it's made me perhaps suppress stuff that I should have dealt with. So to, long story short, mum was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Uh, I, I can remember turning up to try and see her at home and she wasn't around, which was unusual because we'd arranged to come on that particular day. I remember one of the neighbours saying, oh, she's had to be rushed off to the GP surgery. And then came this trail of events. And six weeks later, uh, I remember once she'd been through biopsies, getting the phone call from the hospital, and uh, she referred to the fact she'd been diagnosed with the big C. And then it was an absolute whirlwind, uh, frankly, of deterioration, culminating in a kill or cure operation in which they had to remove large chunks of her, which didn't work. Probably I'm 26 at the time, so it, I didn't. I obviously knew she was very ill, and I knew her chances weren't good. But I was building a business at the time. I was in the clothing trade, and my father was very keen that I maintained a summer holiday and got out to Lanzarote. And halfway through, I rang to see how she was, and I remember him distinctly saying, uh, "It's not good news. She's not going to make it." And then came a kind of mad dash to get back in time to see her before. She did go, um, and I've probably suppressed a lot as a result of that, as a result of that message to get on with things, probably a little bit prone to OCD and trying to control different elements of life, maybe because at that point in life, things kind of ran away from me. So that's one example of death. The other example is Pop, who 
soldiered on, spent the last, uh, th then went off on a whole legacy of cruises and tried as best to enjoy himself he could, ended up in a care home for his last 18 months. And there was a kind of, there was a dramatic phone call again. So I was in the BBC studios getting ready for the Saturday football results show and a call came through from the care home to say that it had to be taken into hospital and I kind of just had to drop the program I remember bursting into tears in the corridor at the BBC's main studios up in Salford Keys in Manchester but then from then on it was probably the most perfect death that it could be in so much as about 48 hours after that phone call we were in hospital with him and my sister who's 10 years younger went off to go to the toilet and despite the fact he was very ill he had sepsis and his body was shutting down he managed to open one eye and he said to me it's time and I said I just want to be clear about this so you're saying it's time to let you gently slip away and he said yes and I came back down to London where I live. My dad was based in the northeast. And then I got a call on the following Saturday morning. So this is six days later. And I just knew, I, I just knew what was coming. So where was brother, sister were dashing to his bedside. The one thing that didn't happen with mom is she went quickly overnight and none of us were with her. And I was determined that one of us was going to be with her. So I got my ducks in a row, did everything I needed to do, then headed up. And sure enough, about eight in the evening, everybody else left. And he'd gone by six o'clock in the morning with me, gently playing his favourite Neil Diamond songs, holding his hand and telling him how much I loved him. So if death has to be in the family, it was about as perfect as it possibly could be. And I'm so comfortable with dad's death, actually, Jason, that I will openly say I'm so glad he went when he did and didn't go the following year, which would have taken us into COVID 2020. And uh, it would have been a completely different experience. So long answer two answers instead of one but i hope you can understand why i've described them both because they were deeply contrasting yeah absolutely can we go back to your mum's death and particularly the point where so you're 26 year old um your mum's just been diagnosed she knows it's the big c using her term what sort of conversations were happening then as a family about the big c and or what was going to happen you know what it's really hard and um, my partner now and sometimes my daughter say you can't remember anything about these things that, that seems so enormous. I remember the drama of it. I remember the phone call and the initial tears. And then I remember the various stages of further diagnosis and uh, maybe another biopsy and then obviously the big, big operation. I don't think you want to believe it. I don't think you do believe it. I don't think you believe that you, you know, I'm 26 at the time. My sister was 18. She was doing her A-levels prior to going off to university. So I, I don't think, it's obviously not right, is it? I mean, it's a crazy, ridiculously poor age to have lived for. But what I've learned over the intervening years is that life's not perfect, is it? That, you know, all right, some are lucky enough to have both parents grow to a ripe old age and fingers crossed go within quite a short space of each other at that ripe old age. But for others, it's not the same. So I just, you know, that there would be those visits, there would be the visits into hospital. And then obviously that kind of dramatic end. And the very fact that I was willing to go off on holiday because I had been working hard and I'd been building up quite a successful business in quite a short space of time. I, probably my father was very keen that I did do that to try and get some recuperation and didn't see any benefit in me staying back at home, um, you know, being in the country necessarily. Although it did come out afterwards, I think from my brother, that my mum didn't really want me to go. So maybe she had some inclination that the situation was worse than perhaps the rest of the family wanted to believe. When you were younger and growing up, what messages do you remember getting about death? I mean, was death something that was talked about in your family? No. And my first experience of it would probably be of my mum's mum's sister going, which was quite 
dramatic and probably my memories of that are mom and grand going to clear her place out and finding three or four grand in cash stuffed in teapots and ice skates from youth because she wanted to make sure she covered her funeral and then grand's death itself which probably came three or four years after the auntie um mom never knew who her father was and one of the doctors on the ward actually knew mum's story and actually turned to her the night before my gran went and said, if there's anything that you want to ask, I would suggest now is the time to do it. And that still is a bit of a, a head shag for me because gran was sitting up in bed at the time. And I, I again, I can't, can't quite believe that they could predict that she wasn't going to last very long, but there she was still sitting up in bed and talking to us. Mum elected not to ask her that burning family question and so when mum went to the grave she never did know who her father was but she didn't want to alert gran to the fact that she might not be with us too much longer so no growing up i don't remember conversations about death obviously the older that you get the more you are aware of your own mortality the more when you get to the age of 60 as i am now you suddenly become aware of prominent people going at 62, 65, and it changes your whole head spin on the situation. But no, growing up, I don't remember conversations about death. And of course, your mum was so young. And one of the reasons, like I said earlier, you know, the aims of the podcast to encourage conversations about death and dying, because what we know is that when people, for example, on a practical note, and people plan for what kind of care they want, or talk about what they want at the end of life, and or their funeral, and or sorting out finances, or writing a will, we know that when lots of those things are in place, and they're planned for, then the outcomes are better for those who are left behind. So it sounds like um, your mum wasn't talking about what our funeral wishes were or did you know that i think they kept it in house i think they were as protective as they could be you know mum obviously at some point realized she wasn't going to survive this and was very keen that it didn't dominate our entire lives and that as i've already said we had to get on with it dad on the other hand was aware of the wider aims of the family of me building a business of my sister coming up to her uh, a levels and my brother kind of stuck in the middle of the two of us and finding his own way with his own project i think it did come out afterwards that they that's mum and dad had had conversations about going forward had probably laid down a few markers on the funeral but not mega amounts I can remember us trying to decide who was going to do readings and who was going to walk where and uh, you know who to invite uh, and all the rest of it um, but no they they kept it between the two of us I guess to protect us what's your mum's name Iris just want to move on to thinking a bit about bereavement and about your experience of bereavement when your mum had died. What do you recall about that time? And can you think of anything that helped you? In hindsight, obviously taking the instruction to get on with life, mm -hmm. I probably took it far too literally. I mean, because everything, I mean, she died Monday into Tuesday morning and I was doing a qualification at a business school at the time and the business school was 15 miles from home and everything seemed to be in hand I mean I actually went and did a day on the business course the next day because probably in discussion with my father and brother and sister uh, that's what I did the longer term legacy though is that I've always been a bit of a preparer a great friend of Marie Curie, Chris Kamara is just the most free spirit, will throw his hand to everything. Um, obviously, our paths crossed because he started in the, well, he started as a footballer, but obviously became a sports broadcaster. And Chris will just say yes to just about anything and not worry about the consequences. I'm the kind of opposite, wherever I commit to, I like to be organized, prepared, know exactly what I'm doing. And I do think there's some, there's some ongoing legacy in there of suppression and trying to control things because I suspect all those years ago, life ran away from me. And that was one situation that I, that I couldn't 
control. And funnily enough, my daughter, who never got to meet her grandmother and is now 29, she said, why don't you go and have a little bit of counselling and just see, you know, where that sits in the in the heart of you. But life moves so quickly, you know, in your 20s. And, you know, of course, you can take a little bit of time. But when you've got stuff going on that needs to be dealt with, and we were one of those families that did just spin on. And, and, and dad would have felt it the most of all. We took him away on holiday, I remember. So it would have been myself, my wife at the time, my sister, uh, and I think one of my sister's friends. And we took dad off on holiday. And then before you know it, I mean, poor dad. He would have, he, suddenly he sees his wife die and then his daughter goes off to university. So just left behind with my brother kind of living in an adjacent property. So where there were three in the main house, there's suddenly my dad on his own. It's interesting that thing about what, if anything's been suppressed and counseling for some people can be really helpful and um, equally just having conversations about those, you know, who died with, people who knew them, storytelling, all that kind of stuff can be really helpful. Lots of other things for those who are bereaved, you know, that might be particular pieces of music, it might be listening to podcasts, it might be books, um, it might be rituals around kind of birthdays and anniversaries. And I was wondering whether your dad so I'm jumping forward a bit now, Mark, and, and um, just thinking about your dad's experience of his own death and dying and whether there was any conversations at that time, apart from that last minute eye opening saying it's time. Had there been any conversations prior to that about what he wanted, about what he wanted for his funeral? I think he'd made it clear he wanted to be cremated rather than buried. But aside from that, yeah, dad was prepared. So dad had done power of attorney and I thought approached the whole care home situation with great dignity um, and kind of assimilated it. And again, it was pretty textbook his time there in terms of, funnily enough, some friends of ours had a, a party and we went along and there was a geriatrics consultant there and I was talking to him, dad had just got in the care home. He said, usually most people are going to a care home, will be around for another 18 months to, to two years. But it catches you, doesn't it? Any change in life, Jason, I always think we're never, we're never ready for it, are we? It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's somebody decides that you're no longer the right person for a job or part of your own body starts to deteriorate. We never seem prepared for change. It always comes before we're, we're ready. And I used to, you know, I live in London, so that's 250 miles away. And once a month, I would get the early train out of King's Cross, uh, land uh, about 10.30, go and spend five or six hours with him. And it, it got harder over those 18 months he was in the care home. Each month, the, he was a little bit less responsive, a bit more sleepy, harder and harder to make conversation. And actually, I remember the Father's Day before he went. And by then, it was very hard to have a conversation with him on the telephone. And my partner now, she said to me, I, I, I wasn't going to ring. And she said, no, 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 no. You, you just ring, just try, just ring. And I'm so glad I did, because obviously it turned out to be the, the last one. Uh, I don't, perhaps we're not typical. Perhaps we don't fit the mix. I love them both dearly. It's funnily enough, because it was my 60th about two months ago before we we're recording this, we, we, I, I pulled together a big sort of photo bin of 250 shots from my entire life. And so I just see dad poking out the corner of my eye as I'm talking to you with this rotation going around with his shorts on bare chest in the back garden of the first house we had cut in the, the lawn. It, How lovely. It's beautiful. Actually, it was quite freaky this morning because obviously we've got the cost of living crisis going on at the moment. So we were trying to make this photo, electronic photo frame, go to sleep when we're asleep. So we're not, it's not spinning and using electricity, but it jammed on one of dad 
that was taken towards the end. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous photograph. And it jammed on it, but it was one of those iPhone live photos where the frame moves for about two and a half, three seconds at the start. And, and it, the thing kept waking up as I walked past it this morning and it was like he was moving in the room, but it brought me up short a little bit at first. I, listen, I don't know whether my attitude to death is typical. I'm suspecting there's no right or wrong answers. I suspect if you wanted it in a nutshell that I probably processed mom without enough reflection, whereas dad, I honestly was as perfect as these things can be from a selfish point of view, at least. And I do believe he was completely comfortable as well towards the end there. But from not having been with mum, from none of us, I was absolutely, resolutely determined that he wasn't going to go without one of us there. So, uh, you know, on all fronts, we've had such a, a contrast, haven't we, from young, the old age in, in passing away. And funnily enough, there's a direct split between myself and my sister. Because mum went so early, my sister is very much live life to the full, don't worry about things, get on with it. But because I saw dad's deterioration over the last 15 years of stroke and lung cancer, which he died with rather than of and various other ailments, and then uh, in the current climate as well, having to pay for his own care in a care home. I'm I'm the opposite end of the scale. And I start to think about, oh, blimey, what, you know, what could happen to me? How long could I, I live for? How, you know, how much old age funds have I got? So I make sure I control where I spend my last couple of years if needed. And so I guess within the family, we're a complete and total contrast there, which is helping you draw no conclusions whatsoever, Jason, is it? And and I think, you know, as you're saying, there's no typical and there's no right and wrong. And everybody's experience of death, dying and bereavement is completely unique to them, their family, the relationship they had with the person who died. Um, you've preempted my next question. Um, but before that, that. Um, can I just ask your dad's name? Uh, it was Brian, John Brian, but he was known as he was known as Brian. Are you still smiling out of me for a still version of the photo I was just describing? That? That's so nice. Some of life's questions are harder than others. If you or a loved one are facing end of life or bereavement, Marie Curie is here to listen and help. Call our free support line on 0800 090. 2309 or start a web chat by visiting mariecurie.org.uk forward slash support. So my next question was going to be, do you ever think about your own death? And have you had some of those conversations with your partner or your family? I make a joke of it. So I'll use phrases like, oh, they'll say, oh how are you? Oh, you know, not long for this world. And I'll make jokes like that, which they absolutely don't like. I mean, I did have my 60th birthday, and that is a real, that is one that kind of has brought me up short because I remember back to how 60-year-olds were when I was a, a kid, and they sat around a lot and didn't do very much. Now, I'd like to think I've still got the energy of an 18-year-old, but the simple fact of the matter is that you start to potentially head into the last quarter of your life using dad as a template that your earning power might wane as a result of a little bit of deterioration do I think about it yeah I think about it more definitely I do I I did my DNA test with ancestry.com a few years ago so I've started to have a little look at where my various chunks of DNA come from and started to build a basic rudimentary tree. And you realize, or I realize anyway, that you're a, a dot of sand in a giant, great big desert, aren't you? I mean, let's be perfectly frank. Obviously, I knew two of my grandparents. My grandpa died when I was very, very young. Didn't know one of my grandpa. I'm going to be honest with you. I would have had to fight to learn the names of my great grandparents, let alone my great, great grandparents. There were little bits of storytelling and little bits of myth on a long car journey. But at the end of the day, we are all just passing through. It's a short amount of time, isn't it? But of course, we live in a very short term environment at the moment. But I'm pretty sage about where I kind of 
fit. Am I sounding a bit cold here? Not Jason? at all. Not at all. You talked about how uh, you like to be organized. Mm. And have you done any of those practical planning things around the future, you know, and, and maybe your care and your death or decisions around whether you want to be buried or cremated or writing a will, etc.? I've written a will because I'm with a different partner now and I'm very clear about what I want. And obviously, I suppose if we were talking legacy, I want to make sure that my one offspring, my daughter, is reasonably comfortable so that's all been discussed and negotiated with my partner so yeah um i do have a will i haven't declared whether i want to be buried or cremated and i'll be perfectly frank with you i don't know so i'm not sure i i could declare that i'm aware of the ticking time bomb of earnings and having enough money to see myself through i got divorced after a 27 year relationship and moved from north to south at the age of 48 that's a painful experience jason let me tell you i have to start again there but you know I probably fingers crossed unless i do something catastrophically wrong won't be without a bit of warmth water food and fingers crossed a little bit of love along the way but that's about as far as my planning has gone. Certainly not. You know, I've been very lucky, very, very lucky. And I don't want to tempt fate here. I'm going to touch a lot of wood. In my 60 years and six weeks, as we record this, or two months or whatever it is, I've been in hospital for one night. I got a boot on the head playing football when I was 15 at school. So fingers crossed, my health has been pretty good. And so I certainly haven't started to plan my own demise but i'm aware of the fact of wanting again it's that control thing isn't it i want to have enough to be able to provide for myself if i need it you touched on legacy before you were talking about financial legacy how would you like to be remembered well do you know what i suspected you were going to ask this question i don't actually know what legacy is is legacy a professional thing and yeah occasionally it creeps in my mind that if i passed away quite soon would the programs I work on on television, would they play some sort of little tiny old bit? Would it be a picture of me at the end with the dates of my life? Would it be a little montage of a 30 seconds or a minute of some of my, my better work? I, you, do you know, I'm envious really. I'm oh, not envious. I, I'm very comfortable and happy with my life. But I kind of think about people that have professional legacy, people that have written it astounding books or produce brilliant pieces of music but I've, I've not really done anything like that and I've always been self-employed as well run my own businesses or I think a lot of people think I work for the BBC I don't I'm completely self-employed host lots of events and, uh, and coach people on presentation skills and as a result of that the only real validation is that I'm assuming if people are coming back to me and asking me to still do work for them nearly 25 years after I started, that I must be doing a half decent job. But you don't necessarily get an awful lot of, oh, oh that was great. You just kind of get rebooked and stuff like that. So what's my legacy? I guess I would just, I'll tell you what, I'll take you to my 60th birthday party. And I was a little bit shocked. I invited about 50 people managed to get the invites out two or three months in advance. And I thought, oh, people will be away. They'll be doing this. They'll be doing that. Just about everybody came. And lots of people said lots of very nice things. So I'm assuming the legacy is being a reasonably nice person most of the time, enough that people would come in from Paris or Devon or Newcastle or Sunderland or wherever they came from that day and spend six or seven hours with me and give me some rather nice gifts and say some rather nice things in cards. But aside from that, it's probably not a professional legacy. I feel quite disposable, actually, you know. I might be on your telly screen, but let's be honest, it's chip papers, isn't it? It comes and goes but then again i don't know how it touches people's hearts and the, the, the bits that stick in people's heads sounds like there was a lot of love around at that 60th birthday party mark you know if you're asking me to talk about legacy i was very happily surprised and people have said some lovely stuff going back two hours this morning or maybe an hour and a half before you came on this podcast and you were thinking about coming on mm. is there anything you wanted to say that i've not asked you about 
I think the only thing was, if I'm quite together, say about mum's death, it's because it was 34 years ago and I've spent a bigger chunk of my life without her than with her. I've brought up a brilliant daughter who never got to meet her. And conversely, I think I did the best for my dad that I possibly could on the other side of things. I do appreciate that I've had, you know, you're making me realize even more, although I did realize it, I've got a blessed life that so far I've been relatively illness free. I mean, mum going early was tragic, but it wouldn't be as tragic as losing a child or losing a a, a sibling. Oh, it's just, there are challenges and difficulties that come with with life. I think we've forgotten that and we maybe need to be more aware of that, that I don't know how we thought we weren't going to be the victims of a pandemic when they've come regularly throughout history or wars or financial crashes or political turmoil. All these things happen. It's part of life. But of course, I'm saying this with the benefit of 60 years behind me. I've been through those periods of why me? Why can't I have that? Why are they doing that? It's only when you get some miles under your belt that you realize sometimes in life, it's your turn to be on the ropes and you've got to hold together and try and get out the other side, which is what I think I've done when death has touched me along the way. And then I get invited along to do, there's a big fundraiser that the building industry do for Marie Curie. And I seem to quite regularly get invited along to host around there, usually the sports round at a giant fundraiser. Those guys raise absolute fortunes, but then it, it makes me aware of the wider world through the work that Marie Curie do. And there will always be a quite brilliant speaker that gets up and talks about their experience of death. And again, it just goes to underline how lucky I've been because some of the stories that I've heard, I just can't believe that people could put one foot in front of the other, which again, all power to the framework and mechanisms that Marie Curie helped to put round them to enable them to get through those kind of unimaginable moments. If anybody's listening to the podcast now who's grieving, especially, you know, coming up to Christmas time as well, when we're recording this podcast, Mark, have you any advice or any words? I think try to, even if you feel your network is small, even if you feel your energy levels are low, even if you don't want to push outside your comfort zone, please try and reach out to somebody. Please try and think who there is there. Please try, particularly that comfort zone thing. I've seen so many people through some of the work I do who stay in a very tight corner. And I know I'm quite outgoing and making this sound relatively easy, but you know, for all our wind and bluster, most of us, a heck of a lot of us are decent human beings that if you just gave an indication that you are struggling, would try and help you. So even if you are in a, a tight corner now, do just try to push out and try and reap the benefits from involving somebody else and sharing your your current situation and of course these things will pass just as i just as i've been describing those scenarios that we've had over the thousands of years of civilization you know further down the line life will never be the same as it was without a loved one but life will take new shapes and new forms and life can turn in a moment it can turn from an adverse point of view but it can also turn from a beneficial point of view you know my daughter met somebody this year and her life has been completely and totally transformed and it's brilliant to see in fact i'm going to take you back to we did a big charity walk for marie curie back in 2011 lots of football related 
people and a couple of high profile people. Chris Camaro was one, Brendan Rogers, the Leicester City manager was a, another, the owner of Middlesbrough Football Club, Steve Gibson, several others. And we went on this walk with a, a load of uh, supporters as well. A load of supporters and one lady had signed up to do a Marie Curie fundraising walk and had got thrown in with a load of hairy bottomed football fans knowing absolutely nothing about football. It was absolutely like, anyway, here we are 11 years later and we had a reunion six months later of this great achievement and raised quite a bit of money for Marie Curie. And then the reunion numbers started to drop until there was four of us from very different walks of life. Uh, a person that had worked at the EFL who were, uh, Marie Curie was a former charity partner of them. So the English Football League, uh, somebody else that had come who was a supporter, the lady who had no football knowledge and myself. And we have got together three, four times a year since. Three of them have had weddings, which we've all been to, having offspring and all the rest of it. But the lady, I won't name her because she'll kill me. The lady would always, every time we got together, uh, she would tell us about the latest travails of her love life. And we'd take the mickey out of her and all the rest of it. And suddenly she met somebody and it is just a joy to see. So, folks, if you're struggling out there right now and you can't see the wood for the trees and you've had a terrible mum before you, try, try, try to hold together. Try to gently push out of your comfort zone and trust that life can take a new direction. It might never substitute for the one you've had. But there are great things out there as well as challenging moments and trust that one of those great things could happen to you. I love that. And also, I think that message about reaching out is a really key and important one. And, and even for those who might be listening, who don't have anybody to reach out to, there are many, many, many organizations out there, helplines, for example, you know, if somebody just wants to have a conversation or is struggling, I think that reach out message is, is a really important one, Mark. My well, last... can, can I, can I just add to that and just yeah. say that Turn to GP, or please just try and look at what support groups are around. And I know that can be hugely daunting to have to walk into a group of strangers, but those organisations are not the big bad wolf out to bring you down. They're there to help you. And if you can just get through the door and unbutton a couple of the buttons on your coat and go and sit down, people will gravitate towards you. And if you give an indication that you need help people will try to help you so it does take effort but it's i think it's worth the return sorry to interrupt jason it's the hard no 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 it's the hardest thing though isn't it walking through the door that first step's the hardest thing can be the hardest thing for some people yeah 100 percent. but do just try to push because we never know where that one comment can lead right at the beginning of the conversation you said to me um you didn't know if you were looking forward to being on the podcast because you know what was it going to be like having a conversation about death and dying so my last let me clarify that jason i was looking forward to being on it but it's just when we're talking about death I, I, as the words were coming out of my mouth i'm thinking gosh i hope i don't sound callous or glorifying it but you know what i have enjoyed talking about my brilliant, brilliant parents who did so much for me and trying to explain my perspective on when each of them were no longer with us. Well, that was going to be my last question, just to kind of ask how it had been being on the Marie Curie couch today. I think they do an amazing job as an organisation. As somebody that works with transitioning sports people and broadcasters, I have to say the tone that you set and that lovely lilt of your voice is so relaxing. You've helped me to open up and you've helped me to do a little bit of exploration. I am sometimes a random train of thought that can be like a, a machine gun. So I hope there's some sort of vestige of sense that comes out of everything I've just said. Absolutely. Well, Mark Clement, thank you for sharing a bit of Iris's story. Thank you for sharing a bit of Brian's story. And thank you for joining me on the Marie Curie Couch. It has been a pleasure.
So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. From planning ahead to coping with bereavement, you can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 080 2309 or search Marie Curie online. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Pan Oceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye.